One of the things that makes me laugh the most is how flat earthers try to refute the globe without any understanding of physics. So today I bring you a video of a flat earther doing just that. As Eric Debay asks, is earth really spinning underneath your airplane? Hello all and welcome along to another episode of the original Flat Earth Friday with me, Simon Dan. Thank you very much for joining me. Before we begin today, I was reading earlier that the new odds of the Milky Way colliding with the Andromeda Galaxy in billions of years is now only 50-50. And I was reading that story on Ground News, which was actually founded by a former NASA engineer called Harleen Kaur, who worked on the James Webb Telescope. Now, Ground News combines stories and articles from thousands of outlets, local and national, in one place so readers can see the full picture of what's being reported around the world. As you can see here with the Milky Way and Andromeda story, Ground News shows you if there's any political leanings for each publication. In this instance, we can see that it's mainly centre-driven, with 136 total news sources. Now, for every story, you get a quick visual breakdown of the news outlets covering it, their political bias, how factual the source is, which entity owns the source, and which countries are covering the story. And actually, Ground News is starting to gain notoriety for its work. They were recently recognised by the Nobel Peace Centre for their impact on media literacy, saying that it's an excellent way to stay informed, avoid echo chambers, and expand your worldview, which is exactly why we use Ground News as well. See every side to every story with access to international perspectives that are hard to find. So then you can make informed decisions where you can read, watch, and share the best information available. And Ground News is mission centric. It's not about eliminating bias but providing better transparency. And they're funded by their community, not by big ads or investors. So go to ground.news slash Simon to stay fully informed on breaking news and compare media coverage. Subscribe through my link in the description for 40% off unlimited access if you support the mission and find it as useful as I do. Thanks again to Ground News. Right, on with today's video which is going to be a full breakdown of Eric's airplane video. This is going to be a good one. We skipped his intro spiel and we joined Eric as he's about to get stuck in. Here we go. In our analysis, we will focus on round trip flights between Atlanta, Georgia and San Diego, California. These coast to coast flights typically cruise at an average speed of 550 miles per hour and have an average flight duration of approximately 3.45 hours, assuming no wind or turbulence. 1900 miles divided by 550 miles per hour equals 3.45 hours. This should raise obvious and critical questions. Does it? It doesn't to normal people because so far this sounds perfectly acceptable. At this latitude, considering that the Earth is said to rotate west to east at 870 miles per hour beneath the plane during flight, how do flights in both directions report nearly identical flight times? In other words, if a plane flies at a constant speed of 550 miles per hour between these two cities, how can the flight times be the same in both directions, given that the Earth is said to rotate from west to east, moving with the plane in one direction, and directly against the plane in the other? Okay, buckle up Eric, the fasten seatbelt sign is on. When a plane takes off, it already has the rotational speed of Earth built into it. It's inheriting that eastward momentum from the surface, like passengers on a moving train. Atlanta is rotating at around 870 miles per hour eastward relative to the Earth's axis. So is the plane, so is the Earth's atmosphere. This is the same principle as tossing a ball in the air whilst in a moving car. The ball doesn't fly backwards because it shares your momentum. Now, the atmosphere is gravitationally bound to Earth and it rotates with it, just like the oceans, the buildings, and you. So planes fly within this rotating atmosphere, not through it like a river flowing in the opposite direction. Eric imagines the Earth rotating independently beneath the plane, like a treadmill moving underneath a drone, for example. But that's not how physics or fluid dynamics work. But here's a fun thought. If you're flying from Atlanta to San Diego, the Earth is spinning at around 863 miles per hour at that latitude. And your plane? It's also moving eastward at that speed as it takes off. Because remember, it inherits Earth's rotational speed. So if you fly east, you're adding your 550 mile an hour airspeed onto the Earth's rotational speed. This means relative to outer space, 
And that's the important part. Your plane is now moving 1,413 miles per hour eastward. But what if you fly west? You're obviously flying in an opposite direction, but you're, the air you're pushing through is still moving eastward at 863 miles per hour. So what you're actually doing is just reducing your eastward speed. That's right, when you fly west, you're still flying east at around 313 miles per hour relative to space. You're always going east, just at different speeds. But here's the catch. None of that matters when it comes to flight times. Because air travel isn't about how fast you move relative to space. It's about how fast you move relative to the air around you. Which, remember, is spinning with the Earth. So both flights, east and west, are pushing through the same moving air. And their durations are affected by Earth's winds, not by its spin. I hope that clears it up. Examining closer, on an eastbound flight from San Diego to Atlanta, the Earth's rotation moves in the same direction as the aircraft. Conversely, on a westbound flight from Atlanta to San Diego, the Earth rotates in the opposite direction to the aircraft's travel. These opposing dynamics present significant challenges that become apparent upon closer examination. And this is where Eric is probably going to examine this relative to space. He's mixing up his frames of reference. In our first scenario, when heading east, once our plane is airborne and detached from the Earth's surface, it leaves San Diego heading for Atlanta. The Earth is said to rotate eastward below our flight with us at 870 miles per hour, while our plane eventually reaches its own independent cruising speed of 550 miles per hour. How then will our plane ever arrive in Atlanta? Because the plane doesn't lose the Earth's rotational motion when it takes off. It keeps it. As we said, when it leaves San Diego, it's already moving east around 870 miles per hour. Because that's how fast the Earth is rotating at that latitude. And the air it's flying through, as we've already said, is moving that direction at that speed too. So the plane isn't trying to catch up with Atlanta. It's already moving toward it with Earth. And it's just making adjustments through the rotating atmosphere. To clarify, our plane's cruising speed of 550 miles per hour is 320 miles per hour slower than the Earth's rotational speed of 870 miles per hour beneath us during our flight, as the Earth's direction of spin and our plane are heading in the exact same direction and latitude. What worries me is that Eric could have answered this question with a simple search on the internet, yet he's made an entire video on the subject. In our second scenario, as we begin our return flight to San Diego from Atlanta, the dynamics change entirely, further complicating the official explanations as to why the flight times in both directions are almost identical. Once the aircraft lifts off and disconnects from the Earth's surface, San Diego is now approaching our plane at a speed of 870 miles per hour due to the eastward spin of the Earth bringing San Diego directly to us, while simultaneously directly approaching San Diego our destination city at an independent flight speed of 550 miles per hour. Our plane and San Diego are now closing in on each other. This should, in reality, significantly reduce our flight time as the two combined speeds effectively create a far faster convergence speed of 1,420 miles per hour. Yes, but as we stated, the atmosphere is moving against you in this direction. Once again, when the plane leaves the ground, it retains the Earth's momentum. Because you, the plane, and the atmosphere are all moving together. So no, San Diego isn't approaching you at 870 miles per hour. It's rotating at the same rate as the air you're flying through. You're just flying westward within that rotating system. The actual flight duration should now be shortened to just 1.33 hours rather than the actual 3.45 hours observed daily for this specific flight. 1,900 miles divided by 1,420 miles per hour equals 1.33 hours. The fact that the actual daily flight times between these two cities are almost identical in both directions, assuming no wind or turbulence, should clearly reveal that the Earth does not rotate, but rather rests. Apart from the fact that the flight speed is relative to Earth speed in both directions. Put it this way, let's imagine you're on a train that is 100 metres long moving 100 miles per hour. Now, if you get up and walk from the back of the train to the front, and then from the front of the train to the back again, would it take you wildly different amounts of time to walk that? Of course not. It takes roughly the same time to walk in either direction, because you and the train are moving together. The first counter-argument within the official narrative 
attempts to explain the identical flight times between these opposing scenarios by invoking the principle of conservation of momentum, a fundamental concept in physics. According to this explanation, when our plane flies from San Diego to Atlanta, it retains the eastward spin imparted from the Earth's rotation at takeoff, which is approximately 870 miles per hour at this latitude. So Eric has looked up the answer. I guess he just doesn't buy it. Let's see why that doesn't work for him. How does an airplane, once airborne and detached from the ground, maintain the momentum it is said to inherit from the Earth's rotation at takeoff during its flight to Atlanta? Right, when a plane is sitting on the runway stationary, it's already moving eastward at the same speed the Earth is rotating, at around 870 miles an hour in the case of Atlanta. Once it's airborne, it doesn't need to hold on to that momentum. It just keeps it. That's fundamental physics. Consider a baseball being thrown from west to east, similar to an airplane. Does it continue on its initial trajectory unchanged, or does it begin to arc towards the ground? due to gravity and air resistance, almost immediately. Conventional wisdom tells us that a baseball will indeed begin arcing downward. Would an airplane not be subject to these same principles? A baseball doesn't have Rolls-Royce engines hanging off the side of it though, does it? Come on, Eric. The continuing argument to this states that an airplane maintains its initial velocity inherited from the Earth's rotation at takeoff through continuous propulsion from its engines, which counteracts any slowdown. However, we must remember that once an airplane leaves the ground, it is no longer propelled by the force of a spinning Earth. What? That's not how physics works! The Earth isn't propelling anything! When you're standing on the surface, you're always moving! Eastwards! At hundreds of miles an hour, like we've already stated! And when you take off, you keep moving at that same speed, unless something affects your speed! Additionally, air resistance acting against the plane, increasing with speed, continually works against any initial velocity boost provided by the Earth's rotation. The net result is that once airborne and disconnected from the ground, the airplane's forward motion relies solely on engine thrust to maintain the required speed of travel. This is because any initial contribution from the Earth's rotation at takeoff is soon negated by continual air resistance. <laughs> no, it's not. Yes, planes experience air resistance because they're moving through air. That's normal. But as we've said, the air itself is also moving with Earth. So air resistance doesn't erase Earth's rotation. It just opposes the plane's movement through the atmosphere, not through space. In order for air resistance to truly negate that conserved momentum, you would need a sustained headwind of 870 miles per hour. That's over three times faster than the fastest wind speed ever recorded on Earth. So no, air resistance doesn't negate Earth's rotation. That's just bad science. It's bad disaster movie logic, to be honest. Eric, you're really showing your hand here regarding physics knowledge when you say things like that. Absolutely amazing. To further support this, it is important to recognize that passengers on commercial flights are never informed that they are traveling at speeds upwards of 1,420 miles per hour to counteract the Earth's rapid rotation during some flights. Yes, because your relative speed to Earth's surface is 550 miles per hour, and that is all that matters. We never hear relative motion mentioned or referenced at any point, past or present, concerning commercial flights. The only speed ever mentioned is the ground speed, which is typically around 550 miles per hour, or slightly higher with a tailwind. Without wind, your relative speed compared to Earth's surface is your ground speed, Eric. It should be quite apparent that the plane maintains an airspeed and ground speed of 550 miles per hour in both directions which supports the consistent flight times observed for these daily flights, aligning perfectly with the scenario of a non-rotating Earth beneath it. A stationary Earth logically explains identical flight times in both directions, eliminating the need for the adjustments and complex explanations required for a spinning Earth. Except flight times aren't ever identical, are they? And that difference is usually caused by jet streams, something that's inexplicable on a non-rotating flat Earth. In summary, the concept of conservation of momentum proves ineffective in our scenario once the plane becomes airborne. Although the airplane would theoretically inherit an initial burst of momentum from a rotating Earth at takeoff, this momentum is quickly negated by air resistance and gravity. Once airborne, the plane operates as an independent entity, 
with external forces continuously counteracting any inherited momentum, effectively nullifying the predicted effects of the conservation of momentum principle. Chatting absolute rubbish, Eric, as always. Why don't you test that claim with a helium balloon inside the back of a moving truck, just like Action Lab did, and then come back to me. Dear, oh dear. Well, there we go, everyone. What do we think of that one? Eric's claim totally dismantled, don't you think? Let's wrap this one up, shall we? Then let me know in the comments below what you thought of Eric's video. As I say, we're all done and dusted for another Flat Earth Friday. Thanks so much for watching today. As ever, it's very much appreciated. If you enjoyed it, please do subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Remember, we're on daily videos now. And if you really liked it, a big thumbs up, thumbs up would be helpful too. Just enough time to once again thank Ground News for sponsoring today's video. Remember, go to ground.news slash Simon to stay fully informed on breaking news and compare media coverage. Click the link in the description for 40% off unlimited access if you support the mission and find it as useful as I do. I've been Simon Dan, have yourselves a great day and I'll see you tomorrow for a Saturday session where I'm tier ranking conspiracy theories. See you then.